Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the City Council's Committee on Health. I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the Committee. I'm pleased that we are joined by Stalwart Health Committee member Keith Powers, Council Member from here in Manhattan. Uh, we will be joined by other colleagues shortly. This is a busy day around City Hall. Uh, you know we have a hearing in the next room on Amazon, which I uh, am aware also sells vaping products. We probably could have just combined the two hearings and been much more efficient. But alas, here we are. Um, today we're going to be hearing testimony on two bills that are before this committee. Introduction 1362, of which I'm proud to be lead sponsor, is a local law in relation to prohibiting the sale of flavored electronic cigarettes. We will also be hearing introduction 1345, which is sponsored by Council Member Fernando Cabrera. This is a local law in relation to prohibiting the sale of flavored cigarettes, traditional combustible cigarettes. At its best, our public, cell, our public health system responds quickly and decisively in the face of emerging health threats. But in the case of teen use of e-cigarettes, we have been frozen in an action. Electronic cigarettes, also known as vapes or e-cigs, are electronic or battery operated devices that deliver nicotine, propylene glycol, glycerine, and flavoring through vaporization or aerosoliz aerosolization. None of these chemicals are good for you. Nicotine is highly addictive with known risks for heart patients, pregnant women, and potential harm to the developing brains of kids with possible impact on their memory and attention. E-cigarettes are undoubtedly less harmful than traditional combustible cigarettes, and they may indeed be a good tool to help people quit smoking tobacco products. But for most of the past decade, that's not how e-cigarettes have been marketed. They have been presented as a glamorous, trendy, even sexy product in ads almost always featuring young, attractive people, a message that young people themselves have massively amplified on social media. This aggressive marketing strategy echoes the messaging of tobacco ads in decades past. And, not coincidentally, tobacco companies themselves have invested tens of billions of dollars into the e-cigarette companies and are increasingly driving the industry. The result, predictably, has been soaring rates of e-cigarette use, not by adults quitting smoking, but by teenagers for whom this product is a gateway into nicotine addiction. Between 2011 and 2015, vaping for young consumers rose 900% with estimates today that no less than 30% of teens, including high school students and middle school, middle school students, are users of e-cigarettes. Even President Trump's Food and Drug Administration has called this, quote, nothing short of an epidemic. Just what kind of e-cigarettes are young people consuming? Are they smoking vapes that mimic, mimic the taste of tobacco? No. They are vaping a veritable candy store selection of fruity and enticing flavors. Here are just a few of the e-cigarette flavors now being sold in stores in this city. Caramel Cafe, Blueberry, Mint Chocolate, Berry Cobbler, Mango, Strawberry Mint, Pina Colada, Cherry Crush, Watermelon Twist. I could go on and on. It's a long list, but you get the idea. And it's simply beyond dispute that these flavors appeal directly to the tastes of kids. It should be noted that you, can sell, you can't sell combustible tobacco products with any of those flavors that I just mentioned. We banned that a long time ago in this city precisely because we don't want to entice young consumers into cigarette addiction. 
It's time we do the same now with e-cigarettes. Adults who want to, com to quit smoking, and I know many of you are here today, will have continued access to their vapes in flavorless or tobacco-flavored varieties. But we must protect kids from the allure of all those candy-ish flavors that are today luring so many into addiction. We will hear today from a variety of voices on this critical issue. Most importantly, we will hear from parents and even some young people who are directly confronting this epidemic in schools, playgrounds, and elsewhere in the city. We will hear from small businesses about the economic, economic impact of a flavor ban, and that's a perspective that we do care about deeply. We will hear from adult smokers who value e-cigarettes as a smoking cessation tool, and we care about that perspective too. But throughout this discussion, our concern must remain paramount, the health of the young people of this city. We have been slow to react to this emerging crisis. We can't afford to linger in an action any longer. I want to thank the committee staff for the health committee who has done incredible work in preparing for this hearing, as they always do. Zay Emanuel Hailu, Emily Barkin, Sara Liss, and I now want to turn it over to the administration um, in the person of the newly minted commissioner of DOHMH, Dr. Osiris Babo. Please take it away. Thank you, sir. Um, good afternoon, Chair Levine and members of the Health Committee. I am Dr. Oxidis Barbeau, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on these important issues and have this be my inaugural appearance before this committee as Commissioner. Um, as the city's doctor, my highest priority is to improve the health of all New Yorkers and reduce health inequities. It is therefore fitting today that we are here to discuss the dangers of both menthol and flavored e-cigarettes, two issues of significant health risk and disparity. As a doctor, the most important advice for a long, healthy life that I can give New Yorkers is to never start smoking and to get help quitting if they already smoke. They should call 1-866-NY-QUITS. This advice applies to all tobacco products. As a pediatrician, I also know how especially important it is to prevent New York City's youth from becoming addicted to nicotine, which is now of grave concern because of the increasing popularity of e-cigarettes. First, I will address e-cigarettes. Between 2001 and 2017, New York City's youth cigarette smoking rate dropped by 72% from 18% to 5%. To this is a testament to the serious work we have undertaken to ta tackle tobacco over the last two decades, making New York City a national leader in tobacco control. Together, we have worked to enact bold policies specifically targeted to prevent youth initiation of ta tobacco and e-cigarette use including restricting the sales of flavored tobacco products and banning the sale of e-cigarettes, cigarettes, and other tobacco products to those younger than 21 years of age at local retailers. We have also updated the Smoke-Free Air Act to prohibit e-cigarette use everywhere smoking is prohibited. And we have reduced the availability of these products by banning their sale at pharmacies. The recent package of laws passed in 2017 and fully implemented in 2018 help us move, help move us towards our goal of reducing the number of smokers in New York City by 160,000 by 2020. I want to thank Speaker Johnson, Chair Levine, Council Member Cabrera, and others in the Council for their leadership in this effort. While these laws are significant in our fight against adult and youth tobacco use, they are not enough. Despite this progress, youth e-cigarette and other tobacco product use, including cigarillos, little cigars, and smokeless tobacco products, has been increasing substantially. 
Although e-cigarettes have been on the market for less than 10 years, in 2017, over 17% of New York City public high school students reported vaping at least once in the previous month. E-cigarette use is now more than three times as common among youth as smoking cigarettes. The rise in popularity of these products threatens decades of progress we have made in fighting youth tobacco and nicotine use. Let me repeat, in 2001, 19% of public high school youth used one or more traditional nicotine products. In 2017, that number increased to 21% driven primarily by e-cigarette use. And I want to just draw your attention to this graph that illustrates um, how dramatically in blue you see the decline of youth cigarette use. And here, starting in 2015, the dramatic rise of e-cigarettes, showing that at 17.3%, if you add it up, we are having more public school youth exposed to nicotine. And Commissioner, if you want to show the public that too for a second, because it's pretty compelling. Thank you. Perfect. Um, and so although e-cigarettes do not contain tobacco, an estimated 99% of e-cigarettes contain nicotine, which can be particularly addictive for youth. The amount of nicotine in e-cigarettes varies greatly between products and is often not labeled clearly or in an easily understandable way. For example, youth may not be aware that one pod of a popular e-cigarette jewel contains as much nicotine as a whole pack of cigarettes. Nicotine is one of the most addictive substances available in a consumer product. E-cigarettes also release potentially harmful chemicals that have not been fully studied to determine their health effects over time, and youth who use e-cigarettes are more likely to try cigarettes in the future. Despite claims that e-cigarettes are an effective way to quit smoking, this is not backed by su sufficient scientific evidence. Further, the e-cigarette industry is rapidly expanding E-cigarette sales nearly doubled between 2017 and 2018, reaching over $2 billion amid more than a 75% increase in market size. And big tobacco has a heavy hand in this market. We know that some tobacco companies have large investments in or outright own e-cigarette manufacturers. Perhaps most critically, many e-cigarette companies deploy nefarious marketing strategies long used by big tobacco, including positioning these products as glamorous and targeting youth with thousands of flavors. Flavors have been identified as one of the top reasons why youth use e-cigarettes, and with options, as you mentioned earlier, and also including cotton candy, gummy berry, and snow cone, the youth appeal is not surprising. And you'll see here in front of me a bottle of uh, sweetened uh, sugary beverage alongside a bottle of e-nicotine, and you'll see how closely they are marketed. Flavors are of such importance to the tobacco industry that they have introduced concept flavors, like purple instead of grape, in order to hinder flavor restriction enforcement in local jurisdictions. The proliferation of these types of, of flavors for both tobacco and e-cigarette products is widely believed to be an intentional effort by the tobacco industry to try to flout the laws already in place. Strong retail enforcement of these laws is needed given the deceitful steps the tobacco industry has taken in response to past efforts. These potential harms and dangerous marketing strategies, coupled with the Surgeon General's declaration that e-cigarettes have reached epidemic levels of use among our younger generations, are cause for alarm and immediate action. New York City now more than ever must act to protect our youth from these products. Now I'd like to turn to the second issue at hand today, menthol. Among New York City youth who smoke, nearly two-thirds reported having started with menthol or another flavored tobacco product. Menthol, like other flavors, helps conceal the harshness of tobacco and produces a more appealing product 
that is easier for new users like youth to tolerate. But this is not just about protecting New York City's youth. There is a bigger picture here to paint, one fraught with discrimination as well as racial and health inequity. For decades, Big Tobacco has targeted communities of color with menthol cigarette marketing campaigns. Unfortunately, I can tell you that these campaigns have worked. In New York City, menthol cigarettes are used by 85% of black adults who smoke and 64% of Latino adults who smoke. This is unfair and unjust and is a true health equity issue, one perpetuated by big tobacco and ignored for decades by federal, state, and local governments nationwide. If we don't act now, we will lose ground in our fight to protect future generations and communities of color from big tobacco's deadly grip. The potential health impact here is very real. We know that tobacco use is a leading cause of death and we must reach the day when smoking related and preventable diseases such as heart disease and stroke are not the key drivers of premature mortality in New York City. We estimate that over 100,000 New Yorkers may attempt to quit smoking immediately after a ban on menthol takes effect. That's over 100,000 people potentially protected from these deadly products and the dangers of smoking. This administration will not tolerate these discriminatory, predatory actions by the industry, and we are here to join you in taking a stand and taking action. I thank the council for recognizing the dangers of flavored e-cigarettes and menthol products. And Chair Levine, I thank you and Council Member Cabrera for sponsoring these needed pieces of legislation. The administration fully supports banning all flavored including mentholated e-cigarettes, as well as banning the sale of menthol cigarettes and other tobacco products. Doing so is a critical step in protecting our city's youth and communities of color. I look forward to working with you on passage of these bills. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Commissioner. And we're gonna pause because we've had such interest from the public in attending the hearing. There's a line of people outside and so we're going to switch to the larger room now that the other hearing cleared up, and then we'll continue with Q&A. Uh, the sergeants can help guide everybody. Okay, thank you. When, 